Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Theological Arsonist. Today I am very excited to have my brother, my brother, <coughs> excuse me, Joshua joining me again. Um, he's been on this podcast once. We talked about justification by faith alone the last time he was here. And this time we're going to be talking a bit about um, the eschatological ramifications of reading scripture from start to finish, Genesis all the way through to Revelation and how eschatology proceeds soteriology as the episode's titled. So for those of you who don't know Joshua, um, he's a good dear friend of mine, but uh, brother, please tell us a little bit about who you are for those who might be new to the channel. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Joshua Janier, I'm 18 years old, I'm currently um, in high school and I'll be going to college real soon. Reformation Bible College to get my BA in theology and hopefully, Lord willing, after uh, college, go get go out and get my master's and hopefully um, my PhD. But I'm really interested in systematic theology. Um, I consider myself a systematician. I think that's like something that I'm really going to major in. But I'm also, due to the topic today, I, I really love biblical theology, um, the organic flow of revelation. Um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see because the, the, the Bible doesn't speak to us in a systematic way. I can't turn to page 105 to find the doctrine of justification, right? It's, it's linear. So I'm, I'm really interested in eschatology, biblical theology. It's because my favorite theologian is Gerhard is boss, which I'm going to quote a lot today. But uh, yeah, I'm just so happy to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming, brother. And uh, yeah, Joshua is, I, I like to tell people, he is the youngest guy I know that uses the biggest words I know. <laughs> so he's, uh, he's very, very smart, and I am thrilled to have him talk about this subject. Um, real quick, for those of you who have supported my ministry for a while, I just want to say thank you. And for those of you who are looking to support my ministry but don't know where to do that, please go and click the Patreon link that's either down in the description or on the banner of my, my YouTube page, and you can support me there. Um, and anybody who's watching who's new, please subscribe. Really glad to have you here. So Joshua, let's dig into this subject. You can start us wherever you want and we'll, and we'll yeah. go from there. Yeah, just, just to give a, a basic introduction to eschatology, right? The word eschatology, eschatos, meaning you know future, and then logos, the study of last things, right? And when I say eschatology precedes soteriology is that in Genesis 1 through 3, there's an eschatological end, right? It's not just Adam is created, planted in the Garden of Eden, and he's supposed to perpetuate there forever. No, there's an eschatological end. And due to the plague of dispensationalism, like the Schofield uh, Study Bible, it has been common to see eschatology as something that's futuristic, right? So, you know, like, as you said, the last seven years of history, um, but something that the Reformed tradition emphasizes and other and theologians like Richard Gaffin, Gerhard is boss, and Meredith Klein is that eschatology precedes soteriology. And we would, we would call that pre-redemptive eschatology. There's a distinction between pre-redemptive eschatology and redemptive eschatology. When, when talking about pre-redemptive eschatology, we're focusing on Genesis 1 to 3. What, what's going on? What is, what is the organic flow of revelation? And, be, and it's really sad to see that even people that I know that call themselves reform, a sort of rationalistic way of interpreting Genesis has come in. We, we interpret Genesis to, to be talking about science when it has nothing to do with science. Rather, it has to do with consummation and covenant with the triune God, right? We need to see that when God speaks the universe into existence, there's an eschatological end to that. As Gerhard Isval says, the universe as created was only a beginning, the meaning of which was not perpetuation, meaning to prolong, but attainment. There was an attainment for the image of God in creation, right? There is a goal or a telos in creation of the universe where the telos for us, the image of God comes in is when God, when God's hands creates man from the dust and the spirit confers the image of God on man. It's so funny that I used to think that the spirit was completely absent from creation but it is the spirit of God who confers the image of God on us. And, and we're going to get into this two breath pneumatology because we'll get into that on the third point. But like, but in the second, second verse of the Bible, the spirit of the living God is there. You know, creation is triune, everything, the works of God are triune and also redemption as well. So the spirit confers the image of God on man. Now what we need to understand is that there's a theology behind this image. 
So, and this is where Roman Catholicism, I mean, I, I really think because Rome gets this wrong on the theology of the image of God, that they get mostly everything wrong, right? Mm. Right. For Rome, man is created ontologically flawed, right? Ontology is the study of mes- metaphysics, right? Rome believes that man was cr- created with concupiscence, that there's this eternal lust that Adam is battling as the image of God, as created. Mm. And that's where, that's where the Reformed tradition departs from Rome because um, man has created the image of God, as the Heidelberg Catechism says, God created man good, right? God created man very good. And right. after his image in true righteousness and holiness, that he, may, that he may rightly know God, his creator, heartily love him and live with him in eternal happiness to glorify and praise him. And that's where Rome and the Reformed tradition part, because for Rome, there's a problem in disproportionality in the image of God. Man is created. So basically, this is, this, there's a false dichotomy. Man is naturally created in the image of God, but likeness is super added to him. Hmm. If that makes sense. I think so, so there's a there's there's a false dichotomy between man as the image and man as likeness. And this this permeates into their doctrine of the sacraments, the purpose of the incarnation, etc. Hmm. Um, and what we need to understand that when man is created in true righteousness, holiness and knowledge, this isn't something that's super added. Right. As Rome says in the donum super additum, but this is something that is innate to the image of God. Right. And man is bestowed with true adornment for the image of God, because that is what's lost at the fall. For Rome, what's lost at the fall is the likeness. Right. As I I believe that Rome has this kind of a semi Pelagian view of man, that what's lost at the fall is just the likeness. The will is wounded, not totally defiled. And that's, that's where we can get into errors. But what's lost at the fall, according to the Reformed tradition, is the adornment for God. Man is created naturally wanting to glorify and enjoy his creator. That's something that is innate to him in the image of God. Now, it being innate is something that is mutable, right? That means susceptible to change. And Herman Bovink is really good at, at pointing out um, Adam's state of innocency, right? It was mutable. It was able to fall. It was susceptible to, to change. So this is what Bobbin said. Adam stood at the beginning of his career, not at, an, not at an end, right? The Lutherans would say that Adam was created with eternal life. That's why Lutherans affirm the apostasy of the saints. Adam was created with eternal life. He lost it. Therefore, you could lose eternal life. That's not, that's not what the Reformed tradition says. It says that Adam is created in innocency, able to fall away from the true righteousness and holiness he already possesses, right? His condition was provisional and temporary and could, and could not remain as it was, right? Adam's, so basically, it's really important to get that when Adam, Adam is in the garden of, you know, if you, read the, if you read the scriptures, it calls it the garden of God. This was provisional life-giving fellowship that adam receives from the triune god provisional and able to change there was if adam the the way that and we're going to get to get to this in the second point the way that adam would go from provisional life-giving fellowship with the triune god to life-giving fellowship with god in heaven is by way of covenant and obedience right. but let me, let me finish this quote his condition was provisional and temporary and could not remain as it was it either had to pass on to higher glory eschatology or to sin and death, right? And if you read your heart as Voss's, you know, eschatology, the, the Pauline eschatology, there's an antithesis between life and death, right? There's these two polar realities that stand for the image of God in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life symbolizing covenant fellowship with the triune God, and then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolizing death, separation from God, because what is death? separate what is that separation from life and god is life in himself right um right the penalty of transgressing the command was death the reward for keeping it by contrast was life eternal life our common conscience already testifies that in keeping god's commands there is a great reward and that violation of these commands brings punishment and holy scripture also expresses this truth over and over it sums up all blessedness associated with the doing of God's commandments in the word of life, eternal life, both in the covenant of works and that of, the, and that of grace. Scripture knows but one ideal for human being, and that is eternal life. The telos for the image of God, there's, there are telos is 
covenant fellowship with God, right? What it means to be created in the image of God is not that we have these, these reasoning faculties that we can, that yes, we are in a sense like God, but what it truly means to be created in the image of God is that we are fit for communion with God, that which we were created for, right? If we look at Revelation, what is it? It's communion. It's face-to-face -face communion with the triune God, and that, that is our telos. That is why we were created. That was our goal, to glorify God and enjoy him forever, mm. um, right? And there's passages to support this. Leviticus 18.5, Ezekiel 20.11, Psalm 9.13, Matthew 19.17, Luke 10.28, um, Luke and Galatians 3.12. 3, um, Hence, Adam still stood at the beginning, created the image of God in a state of, he was, we, Paul says that he was in a state of indefinite probation, that he was able to fall and able, able to be, be, Voss uses the word escalated reality or to be advanced beyond his state, that his, his estate was no longer mutable, but immutable. And that would happen by covenantal obedience. As yet, he did not have this reward of eternal life, but still had to require it. He could still err, sin, fall, and die. His relationship, his relation to God was such that he could gradually increase in fellowship with God, but could also fall from it. And that's the end of Bobbin's quote. So basically, what Bobbin's trying to get at is that man stood in the Garden of Eden, right? Provisional life-giving fellowship with the triune God. The Garden of Eden is not an abode for man, but it's where man receives life-giving fellowship from the triune God because the waters of life flow from the garden, just as the waters flow from the throne of the Lamb, right? He's, that's provisional, right? Man has created in true righteousness and holiness and knowledge. He's able to retain all that he has by covenantal obedience and he's also able to throw away all that he has by sin and death and that's something that we want to point out because rome says that man is created in the image of god and likeness is something that is super added so therefore when man falls what's lost is the likeness of god right something that was super added to his nature and Voss is going to get at this soon right and that's that's really important to get because if we, you know, that that's where the externalism of Rome comes in, right? That everything is external, right? What grace does for the Roman Catholics is elevate nature, you know, and grace is only needed where sin is in the world. And we don't say that grace elevates our nature, but as the Bible says, it restores us to the image of our creator. But uh, I'll, I'll let you ask me any yeah, questions. Yeah, that was a lot, man. That was awesome. Um, what, what I want to do... Um, for, for people who might be watching who are maybe newer to mm -hmm. covenant theology just in general, if you could kind of, because I think it's, it's important to establish uh, definitions and stuff, if you could kind of just do a brief walkthrough of what do you mean by Genesis 1 through 3 being covenantal rather than scientific? What do you mean by covenant of works versus covenant of grace like what, what do we mean by these things just for people who might be be new to the subject yeah of course um it's really really important to get is because right we say we, we believe in the incomprehensibility of god right god is not as carl bart says holy other no god is transcendent but yet he's personal because he relates to us by way of covenant and we we must view genesis one through three because of scriptures in the new testament also in the Old Testament, right? Hosea 6, like Adam, they transgressed the covenant, right? The way that God remains incomprehensible, transcendent, and immutable, but yet relates to people who are mutable is by way of covenant. And that's so important to get because we are all in a covenantal relationship to God, right? But when we, when we talk about covenant theology, right, we think of Genesis 2, right? Do this and live, right? You may surely eat of all of the trees of the garden, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but of this tree, you shall not eat. Blessing Do this. And curses, right? Blessing and curses, right? The, sh the sanctions of the covenant, blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And this is where the active and passive obedience of the mediator comes in, right? Christ, through his active obedience, he wins for us the blessings of eternal life, right? But Christ, by his passive obedience, he simultaneously takes on the wrath of God for the curse that we should have bore under Adam, if that makes sense. But right. the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was offered to Adam upon the condition of perfect perpetual obedience. Do this and live. Now, that might sound legalistic because... In our, in, our, in our eyes, it is, right? The reason why we are not in a covenant of works is because we are fallen, right? Adam is created, 
in true righteousness and holiness and knowledge. Adam is able to do good out of the goodness of his nature, but he would attain the highest freedom to only do good by way of covenant, right? Adam was able to obey. The reason why we emphasize justification by faith alone is because we're not able to obey. Like hypothetically, if we were, if we were able to obey, we still couldn't do it because we're condemned under Adam. Right. And that's the importance. That's, that's, that's Genesis one through three. That's the covenant of works, right? Wherein life is offered to Adam and his posterity, meaning us upon the condition of perfect perpetual obedience. If that well makes said. sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Another thing I just want to briefly touch on, and this might be going off the, the trail just a little bit, but mm-hmm. I think it's important. I have increasingly met a lot of people who want to hold to the idea of theistic evolution and stuff like that. And I just want you to briefly touch on why not only is that unbiblical, but moreover, it actually destroys the very essence of what's being described and set up for us in Genesis one through three. Yeah. I mean, uh, I have, I have a couple of friends that hold to that, but really if, if we don't view that, Truly, we're, we're not, and that's why I'm saying like rationalism is finding its way in the pews. If, if we don't view Genesis 1 through 3 as covenantal, as God conferring himself in the, in the Garden of Eden, and then therefore condescending to us by way of covenant that we may enjoy God, then we just, we completely, you know, because what is the whole Bible about? The whole Bible about, the whole Bible is about God conferring himself in a communion bond with his image, right? We see this in the Garden of Eden, right? The Garden of Eden is a mountain, right? Because the waters flow from that mountain, right? Right. It's where man receives life-giving fellowship from the triune God, right? Mount Zion, right? Mount Sinai, right? Right. The temple, God wanting to commune with his people. And then finally, in this climactic event in the incarnation, God himself comes down to us, right? And where do we find ourselves in Revelation, right? Right. John says, I, I saw no need for the temple because we are the temple of the living God. Right. right. It's, it's all about God communing with his people. Right. That's that's the eschatology of Genesis one through three. Right. It's the redemptive eschatology, restorative eschatology of Genesis three through Revelation. Right. It's God wanting and, and God. We need to be redeemed in order that we make fellowship with God. And that's the distinction that we want to make. But one is eschatology without soteriology. One is soteriology bound with eschatology. And we really want to get that because the Bible is about God communing with his people, not this theistic evolution stuff. We must view, like, it's truly, truly, I'm pretty sure Moses does not have science in mind. He just, right. I just, he just right. doesn't. Speaking covenantally, right. Yeah. And you see that, that language show up with pretty much every covenant that God makes with his people is I will be their God and they will be my people. That is the, that is the thrust of the, the redemptive narrative and God's dealings with his people. Uh, w- one thing I just wanted to briefly touch on, and I don't know if you're planning on going here, but um, G.K. Beale is a phenomenal resource when it comes to this whole eschatological framework and covenantal language and, and Genesis. And I'm writing a paper right now, and one of the things that I've been kind of including in the paper is, is very similar to what you're talking about. Um, and it's the idea that to be truly human is to be created in the image of God. And when we reject God, as we see people, and I mean, look at our culture right now, it's a, it's a rebellion and a suppression of the truth. Really what it is at the core is it's a, it's a running away from humanity, from what it means to be a human. And so uh, N.T. Wright really brings this out well, but G.K. Beale was talking about how in, in the garden, the garden was the first temple. And Adam was the first priest. And the language that's used there, when, when God tells Adam um, to, um, I think it's to keep and to guard, the, in the Hebrew, I forget the exact words that are used, but that, those two words only come up most regularly throughout the rest of the scripture in reference to the priest and their duties in the temple. And so I think it's so important to recognize that paradigm that, that from the very, very beginning of Scripture, we see not only covenantal language, but we also see that, that the garden is a temple, Adam is the first priest, and then that paradigm through the physical, tangible temple and the physical, tangible priesthood is ultimately pointing towards this, this progressive reality that redemption of Eden lost to Eden restored is coming, right? 
and it is unfolding right now, you know, yeah, it's, it's powerful. It so I just wanted to throw that in. Um, but yeah, continue, please. Yeah, that's, that's so beautiful. So just to recap for the first point, right, the theology of the image of God, man is not created ontologically flawed, disposed towards non-being. There's not a problem in disproportionality, as um, Roman Catholics would say. And what grace does, it elevates the disproportionality. If I can find a quote by Thomas Aquinas, um, I'm, I really, I love Thomas Aquinas, uh, although I disagree with a lot of what he says, but uh, there's still a lot to learn from um, Aquinas. So this is what, uh, this is what um, Thomas Aquinas says. Just as the procession of the persons is, is the reason for the production of creatures by the first principle, so to this pro the same process is the reason for return of the creatures to their end. Since, since just as we have been created by the Son and by the Spirit, so too it is by them that we are united to our ultimate end, right? The, yes, you know, the deeper Roman Catholic conception, and this has to do with this, their theology of the image of God, right? Man is created ontologically flawed in need of external grace. And for Thomas Aquinas, right, man, everything proceeds from God and everything returns back to God, exitus and reditus, right? And the way that man, reditu, the way that man returns back to God in Reformed theology, we would call that covenantal escalation is by grace elevating his nature above his created nature. So you have natural and you have pre-natural and you have supernatural. And the supernatural, of course, is the beatific vision where man participates in the divine essence. And that's where that's where the Reformed tradition, and we're going to get to that in the in the in the last point. What is what is there's a covenantal escalation, right? We, we don't, we, we, that's Thomas Aquinas would say the Reddit, how do we return back to God? And what does that look like? We'll get to that in the third point, but man is created in true righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. And that righteousness, holiness, and knowledge is mutable, but it would be elevated and consummated to an elevated and consummated estate by covenantal obedience. Um, and that's something that that's, that's when God creates man, he creates man very good and not ontologically flawed right. so basically man needs to be I, I was just going to pause you real quick because i i think that this is actually a very important point in establishing just um humanity now in the way that we relate to god if you could just break down what is the fundamental difference between adam and his ability to do good versus do evil and our ability now in Adam, because I think a lot of people specifically who are not of the Reformed tradition will almost make it seem like we still have the same liberty that Adam had. We, we, can, we can make good moral choices to choose Christ. We can also choose to reject Christ. Mm -hmm. and I, I think it's really important to point out the fundamental difference that, that, that transpired with Adam as the federal head. Yeah, and that, that's, that's why I was talking about this yesterday. You know, to affirm a will that is free is to fundamentally not understand the fall, right? There's these two polar realities set out for the image of God in the Garden of Eden, right? The tree of life symbolizing covenant communion with God, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolizing separation from God. Now, if we believe what the Bible says, that Adam is our federal head, just as Christ is our new federal head, right? The benefits of salvation is tied to the benefactor. If Christ is the mediator and surety of our covenant, we must affirm that Adam chose for us. Adam chose to disobey God, and therefore he, he is no longer free, right? As I said, Adam is created in true righteousness, holiness, and knowledge in a state of indefinite probation. And Adam would retain all that he has as created in the image of God if he did not sin. But Adam sinned. Therefore, we are totally defiled. Our minds are darkened, and we are at, we are at enmity towards God. And Genesis 3.15 is really, really important because, right, just as God kills the animal and then we, they, they put on, they, the symbolizing, as Paul says, we put on Christ, right? We put on Satan, right? We, we bear our image from whom we are under. And under Adam, we are under the dominion of Satan. As Paul says, we're children of wrath. We bear our image from him. And that's why regeneration and sanctification, we start to bear the image of Christ. And that's something that we really need to distinguish. And you can really get into semi-Pelagianism, that there's not a distinction between Adam created in a state of innocency and Adam in a state of sin and misery. No, we are in a state of sin and misery under condemnation and wrath. That's our judicial 
That's our judicial condition. But what's our inherent condition? We are totally defiled. We want nothing to do with God. We are separated from God. If we truly believe that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolized separation from God and death, I don't know why, I don't know why we continue to affirm a will that is free, able to do, we do what we want and what we want is to sin because we're in a state of sin and misery. Right. Right. And ultimately that boils down to the fundamental reality that whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So total depravity is not the idea that people can't do morally upright deeds. It's the idea that none of that is going to be rooted in faith. It's all going to come from a self-righteous, um, attitude which is ultimately sin and so without christ it's impossible to do anything pleasing in god's sight yeah that's fundamentally I just, important yeah i just want to i just want to read uh, another another quote it's from thomas and this um, one of thomas's interpreters just to because i don't want to i don't want to misrepresent roman catholics i want to represent them in the yeah, best way absolutely. so this is what lawrence feingold says he's a, he's an interpreter of thomas aquinas it should be evident that to be able to see God face to face, to know him as he knows himself, it is, not, it is not an end that could correspond naturally to any creature. Now, you see, right, in order for them to see God, right, they don't believe that, and this is where, this is where Voss's Pauline eschatology comes in. Man as created in the image of God, according to the Reformed tradition, is naturally ordered to see God, and Rome does not affirm that. Do I have... Okay, the Pauline eschatology is over there, so I'll get it. I'll get it. Yep, later. Yep. Um, um, so this is this is what this is what he continues to say. It is it is not an end that could correspond naturally to man, right? They don't affirm that man is naturally ordered to see God, no matter how exalted his nature. To see the essence of God is proper to only God. In fact, God's own eternal beatitude lies in his infinite act of knowledge and of his own infinite goodness and his infinite act of love of that same goodness in which consists the ineffable interior life of the holy trinity in um, engendering the eternal procession of the son and the spirit the beatific vision therefore is absolutely mysterious participation of sharing of the rational creature in God's own divine life and beatitude. And this is what Thomas Aquinas says, the problem of disproportionality, right? Now, the end to which man is directed by the assistance of divine grace, right? Not naturally ordered to see God, but he needs grace too. And Thomas is going to say the Latin word, um, divine grace is above human nature, right? Elevating man's nature. Therefore, there needs to be super added tar, super added grace to man, to, to man to man a, a supernatural form of perfection by which he may be fittingly ordered to that same end and that's where the externalism of rome is and that theology permeates into their sacramentology what does the you know sanctifying grace is something that comes down from heaven and elevates man beyond, beyond his nature that he can participate in the divine life right yeah that's um, that's, that's a huge fundamental difference yeah, mm -hmm. really important it's really important that that we stay away from that because, you know, what what does what does grace do? Does grace elevate nature or does grace restore nature? Right? Bobbing calls this nature grace dualism. No, grace doesn't suppress naturally created human nature. It restores human nature. We're right. we're, we're, we're being restored to the image of our Creator, and it's really important to get. Right. So, so and, and this is something that Voss calls the deeper Protestant conception of the image of God. Man is created in true righteousness and holiness and knowledge and already disposed towards God in a religious communion bond, right? He's, right. he's already disposed towards God. He's, he's endowed with ethical and adornment for God. And this is what Voss says. Um, that is to say there is no sphere of life that lies outside his relationship to God in which religion would not be the ruling principle, right? Mm -hmm. for, for Rome, religion is something that's super added. For Protestants and Reformed confessional theologians, religion is the ruling principle of our life. You know, at the fall, we don't stop, we don't stop worshiping. You're just worshiping the wrong thing. We right. become idolaters. Right. We're, we're like, I love this quote by Voss. He says, non-religious, maybe, irreligious, never. We're not, we are religious beings by nature. Right? right, we all worship something according to Romans chapter one. It's either the creator or the creature. Right. And that's something that we really need to man is already disposed towards God in a religious communion bond, and religion is to be the ruling principle of his life. Right. And I, and I, I just gotta jump in really quick too because yeah, go ahead. I 
uh, just like you, you don't have the book next to you. I don't have the book next to me. But N.T. Wright in his book, uh, Surprised by Hope, he talks about um, the idea that the, the image of God that, that we're to bear is to reflect God. As image bearers, we are to reflect God. But what, one, what ends up happening, like you just eloquently pointed out, is that when we, we, we fell into sin, it's not that we stop worshiping. It's that we start worshiping something else. And so he goes on to say that if you look at people who worship money, they begin to reflect that image in the way that they treat others as just debtors or, or potential financial investments. Um, when people worship sex, they begin to treat people as objects for that purpose, and they, they begin to reflect that image. Um, when people, uh, and he goes on with just a list of different uh, sins, but he basically points out that the root of all of it is ultimately worship, and what flows from that worship is then a reflection of that image. Um, and, and again, he makes a really good distinction that the image that we were meant to bear, the image that we were created to bear is God's image. Therefore, it's not, it's not a matter of a suppressing of something that is natural within us. It's a matter of restoring what we, mm-hmm. what we were supposed to do in the first place. The, yeah. the, the human is supposed to just revel in his creator, to, to stand in awe of his creator, to want to pursue his creator. And so it's not a matter of, um, you know, and this may be a little bit of a sidetrack, but I think it's important. I think a lot of people sometimes think that when you become a Christian, when you are regenerated, from that point on, you must suppress what you truly want to try to be Christ-like mm-hmm. and holy and obedient. And you, you have mm-hmm. to suppress that sin nature that's really your true self. And that is so backwards. It's not a, it's mm-hmm. not a matter. It, regeneration is a new heart, a new mind, a restoration. Yeah. And so therefore, you are given the new desires you are given the new, uh, a new pattern of living that is in accordance with what you have been designed for, which is right relationship with God. And so sin then becomes something that while still we, humans are still able to fall into it as Christians, is no longer the desire of the heart, which is why mm-hmm. we feel shame and repentance when we do sin, right? So, Yeah, and that's, that's really good. So, so yeah, like, like Voss said, religion is to be the ruling principle of his life, of our life. This is, and this is again, just to emphasize the point, this is where the reformed tradition parts ways from Rome. According to Rome, man is created in the image of God, but there's a separation between image and likeness. Adam is by nature an image bearer, but the definition of image is some, so this is Rome's definition of image. It's some metaphysical correspondence of the human spirit with God. Um, for Rome, like I, like I just quoted Lawrence Feingold, he's a really, really good um, Roman Catholic scholar. For Rome, man is not naturally ordered to see God. And this is, I just, I just found the Pauline eschatology quote. Oh, great. Um, so 1 Corinthians 15, 45, right? This is the text. If there is a natural body, right, then there is a spiritual body. So what is, what is the apostle saying? And this is what Voss says. The, apostle was, the apostle's intent was, was on showing that in the plan of God, from the outset provision was made for a higher kind of body, right? The abnormal body of sin and the eschatological body are not so logically correlated that the one can be postulated from the other. But the world of creation and the world to come are thus correlated, one pointing forward to the other. Right. And that's that's where we get into the eschatology of the image of God. Man is created in a state of innocency and that is pointing to in a state of glory beyond probation. Right. That ethical elevation where man possesses all that he has and he's in fellowship with the triune God where there is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. Also, first Corinthians 15, 45. Um, and that's that's something that that we have to emphasize. So the second point, wow. Um, yeah. Really, really point. quick, and I apologize yeah. to keep sidetracking. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I do think it's important to just point out that the, the, the pneuma body, the spiritual body, does not mean non-physical. It doesn't mean yes. a ghost-like body. I just want to exactly. clarify that because I think some people can read that and go, okay, the natural body, well, that's a physical body, so the spiritual body must be non-physical. We recognize that Jesus, when he rose, he was in a spiritual body, but his body was still very much physical. So I just exactly. I think that's an important point to make. 
Yeah, that's really good. And we're going to get into that into the third point. Cool. So first point, we, we went over the theology of the image of God. Man is created in a state of innocency and in true righteousness and holiness and knowledge would retain all that he had if he was to obey God, right? Now, now, what would be the means by which man would attain all that he has? What, what would be the means by which man would be able to see God, right? Because, like, this is what the Westminster Confession says, right? Um, although the, the distance between God and man is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience to God as their creator, we owe obedience to God as their creator. And we can get into a passage like that to get, to get really the... What is the passage where it talks about the hum Jesus talks about the humble servant and the servant says, we just did what we were supposed to do. Uh, it's Luke, Luke 18 or something. It's, I know yeah. it's like Luke somewhere in Luke. Yeah. I think that's, that's where, that's where the, the, the Westminster divines get the concept that man has created already owes obedience to God as the, as his creator. Um, so let me know when you find it. Yeah, Luke Luke 17. Uh, you mind reading it? Yeah, I'll start from verse 7. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So the Westminster divines, they quote that verse to prove that reasonable creatures owe obedience to God as their creator. Now, what, my first question was, what would be the means by which man would enjoy God? Man would, nat man would see God. And something that the Reformed tradition says is covenant, right? The distance between God and man is so great, the, the creator-creature distinction, that although we owe obedience to God as, their create, as our creator, we would never have any fruition of him as our blessedness and reward, unless some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he has been pleased to express by way of covenant. Right? I said before, the way that God's being remains self-contained, he remains incomprehensible, right? He remains transcendent but yet personal is by way of covenant. Mm -hmm. And the way we get to enjoy God as our creator, naturally see him, the reformed tradition says covenant. Man needs covenant. So man in covenant would be confirmed by obedience in the righteousness and holiness he already possesses. So the telos is a consummated communion bond with the triune God in heaven. So the question is, how would Adam go from beyond probation at Edom where he received provisional or protological life-giving fellowship from the triune God to that consummated communion bond in heaven. And the, and the answer is covenant. So what, what we say after creation, there is a special act of providence. That's what we call covenant um, on God's part. Mm -hmm. And this special act of providence is covenant. Now, something that we want to know is that God in no means is bound to do this. Adam could have been created and Adam could have obeyed God just because he's creating the just because he's creating the image of God, and he, he God owes he does Adam does not owe um, how do I say God is owed obedience just for creating Adam right reasonable creatures owe God obedience, right. but the way that man would enjoy God as his fruition and blessedness is by way of covenant, um, and this covenant is called the covenant of works which I I introduced. Uh, um, earlier, just to just to for people, you know, uh, how do I say? What is it? Repetition is is the teacher's best friend. No, nope. <laughs> uh, the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and him, and in him his posterity upon the condition of perfect and per personal obedience. Right, God in in no way is bound to graciously condescend to us by way of covenant, and that's something that the the, the reformed tradition emphasizes: the creator creature distinction. So with Rome. I would say that the creator creature distinction is conflated, right? Because there's this metaphysical ascent into the being of God, the beatific vision, the creator creature distinction is conflated. And, and my, my third point is really going to emphasize how the creator creature distinction is maintained in, in a state of glory. And that's something. And then you have the deeper modernist conception. So just to, um, you know, introduce your viewers to Karl Barth. Karl Barth was a German theologian. Right. Karl Barth denied liberalism, but in his denial of liberalism, he led to this neo-orthodoxy stuff. 
So Karl Barth would say there's an ontological impossibility for God to reveal himself to me. So Karl Barth denies that the Bible is revelation. What he says, Jesus Christ is revelation. And Jesus reveals himself in this climactic event called Geschichte. It's, it's German for history, right? It's where it's, and, and this is what he says. He calls it God's time for us. It's where God participates in our becoming. So that's why I contrasted the deeper Roman Catholic conception with the deeper modernist conception, because there's a participation for Rome in the, in the being of God. And then there's a participation for, for Bart and God participating in our becoming. So that's, mm. that's uh, just some nerdy stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, really quick. If you, if you could, uh, you, yeah. you mentioned, and I don't know if you're planning on doing this, if you are, then just tell me, I'm going to get to that. But um if you could just quickly define the beatific vision, just a quick summary for people who might be going, what is, what is that? Yeah, the beatific vision or the visio dei, seeing God. I believe in the beatific vision. It's just how we define it. Um, right. There was a pope. There, I forgot the pope, the name of the pope. There was, there was so with, with Greek orthodoxy, you have theosis, right? right. And some reformed, some reformed theologians say that there's an essence energy distinction maintaining the creative creature distinction for rome on the other hand the beatific vision is this metaphysical ascent into the being of god where and this is this is I, I'm, I'm writing an exposition on the canons of door and if you really want to understand roman catholicism you need to understand the eucharist and what they say about the eucharist right. for them right. and and the atonement because something that the reformed tradition says about the atonement because the atonement it, it was if you read church history it was developed right um, you have Anselm's, uh, what is it? Um, what's the name of it? Cur Deus Homla. Why did, why did God become man, right? What we say about the atonement is that Jesus Christ is making a propitiation for sin. He's parting our sins as far as the east is from the west. Roman Catholics would deny that. They says there's, there's, there's no wrath. There's Jesus, does, but, but that's, I, I believe it's a denial of scripture. What they say about the atonement is the same thing they say about the Eucharist, because what is the Eucharist? It's the same sacrifice on Calvary. But this is what they say. It's the reditus, the return back to God, right? They say the, the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian worship. The reason why is because it's the reditus back to God. It's the means by which we participate in the divine life. And that's, 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 that's Thomas Aquinas' theology of the Eucharist. Now, that's, that's for them. The beatific vision is a metaphysical ascent into the being of God. Um, for, for, for Greek Orthodox, it's theosis, right? You, the, the essence of the, the energies of God. We get to see the energies of God. Now, this is where the Reformed tradition defines their beatific vision, right? It's proximity with God, right? Revelation 22, we will see Christ face to face, a face to face communion bond with the triune God not a metaphysical ascent to the being of God, right? Not God participating in our becoming, but proximity, fellowship with the triune God, right? God walked with Enoch, right? God walked with Adam in the garden, face-to-face -face uh, face -face communion bond with the triune God. That's how the Reformed tradition defines the beatific vision. We deny participation in, in the divine essence. We never participate in God's essence but we affirm proximity that we will be in proximity with the triune God in heaven. So of course, you know, I have to bring it up because I messaged you about this and I think yeah. viewers might be going, wait a second. I think I read something in second Peter one about being a partaker of the divine nature. How, how would somebody from a reformed tradition look at that and define that? Yeah, there's a, there's a present tense there, right? We, we are partaking in the divine nature. So, so Rome would say that the beatific vision is something that is future. So Second Peter would not, a good, would not be a good verse to, to prove that. It would, it, I believe that this is talking about our covenantal communion bond that we have through the Holy Spirit with God, that we are starting to bear the image of our creator, that we are starting, that, that we, we say ethical, it's, it's, it's not ontological, it's ethical, because God is holy, holy other, right, we are in Christ, so therefore we are becoming holy, we are being sanctified, um, but I, I, I do not believe that Peter has in mind this ontological changing within human beings, that we, that the soul unites itself to the being of God. Right, I, I would agree, I think that more more than anything what he has in mind there is that through christ jesus we are partaking 
in God. We are partaking in God. We are ultimately going back to the garden. That restoration of what was mm-hmm. lost is ultimately, I think, what, what's at stake there. Anyways, yeah. continue on, my friend. This is wonderful. Yeah. Um, so that, that's how we would define the, the beatific vision. So um, there's, a, there's four principles that we want to get when talking about pre-redemptive eschatology, right? Um, all right, number one, the principle of life in its highest potency, sacramentally symbolized by the tree of life. Um, the principle of probation, symbolized in the same manner by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, the principle of temptation and sin, symbolized in the serpent. Um, and the principle of death, reflecting the dis- dissolution of the body. I'll just, I'll cover three um, for now. So in every covenant, right, there's covenantal escalation, right? And I'll just, I'll give an example with the Mosaic theocracy. That's a, the Mosaic covenant. That's, a, that's, a, that's what we call it, the Mosaic theocracy. There's a covenantal escalation to that. There's an eschatology to the Mosaic theocracy. What is it? Right, in the Mosaic theocracy, we get types. And in the new covenant, we get the antitype, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that's the eschatology. So basically what the Mosaic theocracy is looking for is for these types, the sacrifices, the priests, the temple, to be fulfilled in the antitype, which is Christ. So that's, that's where we get the covenantal escalation. So in every covenant, there's covenantal escalation. And also in covenants, there's also covenantal signs, usually represented by sacraments confirming this eschatological end. In the garden of God, notice how it said garden of God, because we're going to get, let's get into the first point. The tree of life stands in the midst of the garden, sacramentally symbolizing covenant fellowship with God. And this is, I said this earlier, but the garden of Eden is not where man, it's not man's abode. It's the garden of God, right? Right. It's the holy um, of holies, in other it's words. The, it's the holies of holies. Yes. It's where man receives life-giving fellowship from the triune God, right? It's not, it's not an abode for man. Right. And then, then the waters of life flow from the garden, proving that that what what is what is fellowship with God? What is covenant communion, consummated communion bond with God? It's to be with the source of life, which is God. Um, so that's 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 the first point that we that 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 the tree of life stands in the midst of the garden as a sacrament. Right. There's some theologians say that that the sign of the sacrament would confer the thing that is signified. And that's where I disagree, right? The sacrament of the tree of life would confirm that which is signified. And this is where we get into the two breath pneumatology. The spirit breathes on the image of God, right? Um, when God's hands fashions man from the dust and, and the spirit of God confers on him the image of God, right? And the spirit would also breathe on man. Right, right. What does Paul say? Christ has become life-giving spirit. The spirit would also breathe on man, confirming and escalating his estate in a state of glory. So the sign of the covenant, which is the tree of life, would not confer that which it signifies. That's where our theology departs ways with Rome. But the spirit, the two breath um, eschatology of the spirit, the spirit confers the image of God in creation. And the spirit also elevates not man's nature, but man's estate in consummation. And that's what is what does Paul say? The spirit will raise our bodies. Right. right. That's what Paul right. says in, in, in Romans. Right. Right. You know, um, that's that's something that we want to get. To. That's like it's like this studying. This has blown my mind. I was like, where is the spirit in creation? I'm like, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, that's something that we want to get. And then then the the second point. Right. The principle of temptation symbolized by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right those two polar realities right the tree of knowledge of good and evil symbolized probation right and what is beyond probation beyond probation is consummation what we don't want to do is we don't want to conflate probation and temptation right because christ was in a probation right matthew 4 right christ was tempted as well although the hebrew words may be similar beyond probation is consummation beyond temptation is death so I basically covered the three principles. Um, so now, now to get into these covenant signs in the Garden of Eden, um, these covenant signs represent the prospect of eschatological advancement. And these covenant signs are the tree of life and the Sabbath. Those are two covenant signs given to Adam in the covenant of works that symbolize the prospect of eschatological advancement. Right? This is a prospect that stands out for man an escalated future reality and and they're conditioned if we remember the covenant of works is conditioned on perfect personal obedience um okay 
Um, Adam attaining these eschatological ends was conditioned on obedience on this, to the sanctions of the covenant, do this and live, right? The Sabbath finds its prototype in the works of God, right? But the fulfillment of the Sabbath was to take place in the life of man where this eschatological immutable rest would be communicated, right? Right, God, right, God works and he rests, right? Adam was to work and then rest in God, right? It was supposed to find its fulfillment in God, um, right? This, now, just to, just to, you know, really hone in the point, this communion bond is not ontological, right? We never participate in God's becoming um, and God never participates in our, in our being. So, and then the tree of life, we, we, already, we already talked about the tree of life symbolizing covenant fellowship with God. And the reason why we say that, that it symbolizes proximity with God is this is what my good friend Dan Ragusa says. Both the tree of life and the waters of life point to the one who is the source and goal of life. The eschatological reward of life promised to Adam was nothing less than God promising to confer himself in a consummate communion bond of face-to-face -face fellowship to his holy people in his glorious garden kingdom. Um, and that, that's why we say that the tree of life does not, sim does not um, symbolize an ontological reality. God participate, we participate in God's essence, but it's proximity because the waters of life flow and they point to the one who is the source of life, God himself. And I, I got to just pause you there because this is just yeah. too good to, to pass up. But we're, you're talking about where is the spirit in creation? I, I, think, I think we really, in, in just Christianity as a whole, we have done such a disservice by de-emphasizing the spirit. It's typically the father and the son, the father and the son. And it's just kind of the spirit gets lost. And you're like, oh my goodness, when you start seeing it. But listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 7, uh, verse 37. Uh, through 39. Um, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me as the scripture, what scripture is he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament, obviously. As the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit whom those who had believed in him were to receive for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Wow. When you go, when you go and you say, okay, where is he, where is he quoting this from? Well, we see Zechariah 14 on that mm -hmm. day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. And then Ezekiel, what do we see in Ezekiel's temple vision? He talks about living water that flows out of the threshold of the temple and it starts ankle deep then knee deep. And, and soon Ezekiel says it was a river too great to pass. And we see again in Revelation 21, 22, we see this living water flowing and then the tree of the tree, the leaves of the tree of life for the healing of the nations. It's covenant relationship by way wow. of the spirit pouring through creation. And to wow, see that's... Jesus explicitly here point to that reality is just absolutely mind blowing. That, I mean, that's so beautiful, right? Right. This, the, the waters of life flowing from the throne of God, the waters of life flowing from the garden of Eden. But I really like what, what John says, right? Now he said this about the spirit whom those who believe in him were to receive for as for what is he talking about? He's talking about Pentecost right. where those, right. With the, and that, that's something that the reform theology emphasizes, right? Salvation is not sacramental right? Salvation is not initiated by the sacraments. It's, it's initiated by the spirit, right? right? They, have, they had not yet been given the spirit. Be, why? Because Christ has not been glorified, right? right. I, think, I think Paul gets um, to the theme of this in Galatians, right. right? Right? So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, right? So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith, right? In order for us to receive that promised spirit through faith, there needs to be a crucified, dead, and risen, risen Messiah who has the spirit in it of himself, right? That's something that we really, something the mediator possesses the fullness of life in the spirit and conveys the spirit to all who believe, his sheep. Right. And that's something that the Reformed theology and, and Gerhard as well is really good at. Right. right. Historia salutis. Right. Christ dies. Objective. That, that happens outside of our conscience. And then Christ sends the spirit when he is glorified. Why? Because he possesses the fullness of life in the spirit, because he has become life giving spirit. First Corinthians 15. 
he sends the spirit subjective to apply his work to his people. He doesn't send the sacraments. He sends the spirit to initiate salvation. And that's why they call Calvin the theologian of the Holy Spirit. And, and, when, and when you look at, you know, when Jesus says things like, go out, make disciples of all nations, and he says, uh, pray this way, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The means by which that happens is that from heaven, the spirit is poured forth. And from that, I mean, think about it. The spirit is described as living waters. That's the way the spirit is described. And what, it, what do we see in the Old Testament? That one day, the knowledge of the Lord will be like what the waters cover the sea. Could we be talking about the spirit being filled, filling all things so that God is in all and all? I think, yes. I think that's what we're, we're seeing. Exactly. And it's just, Oh, it's glorious, man. It's glorious. Yeah, bro. It's, it's so, it's so amazing. But yeah, I mean, just to, just to, just to, to recap the, the three points that I went over. Um, this was a really good, really good discussion. Um, uh, so, right, the creation of the universe, right, and not theistic, we don't, we don't want to read Genesis 1 through 3 as, you know, some theistic evolution or the Garden of Eden being this abode for man, but there's, there is a, there is a eschatological end to the creation of the universe, right? The purpose of creation is not perpetuation, but attainment, right? Right. The theology of the image of God Man is not created ontologically flawed, but man is created in true righteousness, holiness, and knowledge, and love for his creator, disposed towards a religious communion bond with his creator in Eden, right? There's no disproportionality in our nature where grace is super added to elevate that so we can be ordered to, so that we can see God, right? God, God remains transcendent, self-contained, holy, and immutable, but yet personal by way of covenant. Right. We should, we should, right. We should, the covenant is found all over the Bible. Right. Right. He, he, his, his, he will never forget his covenant. Right. He gives them covenant. Right. We should rejoice when we hear covenant. It's because it's, it's how we relate to God. We relate to God covenantally. Um, he covenantally condescends to us graciously condescends to us by way of covenant. Right. And then covenantal escalation. There was a covenantal escalation to the covenant of works and that covenantal escalation, right, symbolized by the natural body, was pointing towards the spiritual body. Blessings for obedience, right, and curses for disobedience. If Adam was to obey, he would be blessed and receive that spiritual, and as Jonah pointed out, but it's still physical body. And how? By the spirit breathing on man and, and elevating his estate beyond probation, immutable. Right. And that's why we say that Christians cannot lose their salvation because right. Christ. Right. There's this ethical elevation in a state of grace. Right. Christ is in a state of exaltation. He's the mediator and surety in a state of justification. Christ has possessed the fullness of life in the spirit. And that life is immutable and unchangeable. Therefore, if you possess that life, you are always in his hands. Right. And that's something that, 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 that we need to point out. Right. And I think that's such an important thing to, to point out is that just as if, if Adam is the federal head of the fallen humanity, it would be ridiculous. And I still have yet to hear one person state, no, I, I don't sin. I'm not a sinner. <laughs> no, clearly we accept that as the reality because we, we recognize Adam as the federal head. That's who we are. In the same way, Jesus Christ being the federal head of the redeemed, if we are in Christ, just as sure as we were that we were sinners in Adam, we can be sure that we have the righteousness of Christ in Jesus Christ. And that's just the thing. Our resurrection, our eschatological resurrection at the end of, of, of history when Christ returns, that's not, that's not separated from the eschatological resurrection of Christ in the middle of history, right? And so we need to recognize that the only reason we can be confident that we're going to rise again one day is because we are in Christ's resurrection. And just as Paul says, we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in Ephesians 2. Why are we seated in the heavenly places? Because we are partaking in Christ's resurrection and Christ's vindication at the right hand of the Father, even now spiritually. And so recognizing that this isn't some individualistic thing, this is a corporate covenantal reality that was fulfilled in Christ Jesus that is restoring his people to what Adam failed to do in his probation in the garden. 
Yeah, and uh, I guess this, this will be the last thing, right? What we say, Christ does not restore what was lost in Adam. Christ attains what Adam did not attain, hmm. right? That's a good right? way to put it. Because Christ is a perfect Savior, because Christ is beyond probation, has received the fullness of life in his resurrection, the communication of eternal life, right? right? That is immutable, unchangeable. Therefore, he must also bestow on his people the perseverance of the saints. Amen, brother. Do you have any application you would like to make at the end? Just kind of a recap. If there's like a few things you want somebody to remember and they're like, whoa, this was a lot. What would you say? This is what you take home today. What, what, I, would, uh, what I would say is that study Genesis 1 through 3 and know that eschatology precedes soteriology. Know the plan for the image of God. I know that everybody watching this is creating the image of God. There's some people that may disagree. But know what you were created for. You were created for fellowship with the triune God in heaven, right? Lost in Christ. No, lost in Adam and regained in Christ. If we know that, if we know what we are created to do, right? Because there's a lot of people who, who don't know what they're created to do. I don't know. People say, you know, God doesn't give everybody a, a different purpose. We all have one purpose corporately, and that is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Know that, know that, that eschatology precedes soteriology. Know that you were created to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And therefore that was lost in Adam. And Christ has regained that, that, that perfect opportunity. And it's really a privilege to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And, and we get to receive that by faith. I think that's a, that's a good application. Amen, brother. That's awesome. Well, let me, let me close us in prayer here. Yeah. And then we can call it. Uh, Father God, Lord, we, we just come before you, and I just want to I wanna thank you so much for my dear brother Joshua, Lord, uh, for his heart for you, Lord, for giving him just such wisdom at age 18. I'm just so blown away. Um, and Lord, I just thank you for this conversation. What a, what a beautiful reminder um, that even in our unfaithfulness, Lord, to, to the covenant that you have established, Lord, your covenant of grace is sufficient. And through Christ's obedience, doing what Adam couldn't, Lord, you have paved a way for us to partake in you, Lord. Uh, what, a, what a privilege that is, Lord. And I pray that as we continue to study these things, Lord, you would just give us a zeal for truth, a zeal for, for you, to know you, to know your word. And Lord, I just think of Revelation 21. Christ's words, behold, I am making all things new. And even now, Lord, eschatology since Genesis has been unfolding and is now in the beginning stages of its consummation with the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, Lord. And so right now, we are partaking in watching the Spirit poured out onto the earth, watching your covenant faithfulness to your people, Lord, as you reconcile them. Uh, to yourself in Christ Jesus. You are truly our God, and we are truly your people. And for that, we give you praise, glory, and honor. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.